Shall we begin? Yes. All right. So if you will just mute yourselves, if you're not already muted, that would be appreciated because every little sound in the background from the rustling of papers to the ringing of the doorbell to the barking of your dogs will come across loud and clear. So welcome, welcome, welcome to session two of fall prevention. And this is a joint program by your Albany NORC, Jewish Family Services of Northeastern New York, and Maria College. And I'd like to give, uh, you had a chance to meet Linda last week. Um, I'd like to introduce to you Scott Homer from Maria College, who will be taking part along with the students from the Occupational Therapy Assisting Program next week and giving us some really good demonstrations on what to do when you fall, how to use assistive devices, etc. So welcome, Scott. Thank you, Judy, and good morning, everybody. I uh, was in class with students last week when you were presenting, but I watched back the video, and this is a great group of folks and some great information that Judy and Linda are sharing with you. My students have been working hard to put together, um, many of them are actually in class during this time, so we're recording some videos, and then we're going to tie it all together with a live presentation so that you can see some uh, real-life examples of how um, we can help, um, and I'm looking forward to sharing that with you next week. Thanks very much, Scott. Thanks for so, having us. Oh, my pleasure. So in, so, in a I, normal year, we'd be all together at the college, but uh, here we're going to make the best of it and um, and do it virtually. So we will give you the same high quality content just over the internet. It's a challenge for all of us, and it's. Um, I always tell people if you believe the statement you can't teach an old dog new tricks never never were they a 74 year old like me surviving retooling during the pandemic so i've had to learn a lot of new tricks <laughs> so for a welcome to some of you who are joining us for the first time i know some were not able to make the first session so what I'd like to remind you of is that we do record all of our sessions. So when you get the reminder for the upcoming session, you'll also get a link to the pre-recorded session on YouTube. And I really invite you to review that. Last week we talked about the scope of the problem. We looked at some statistics. And I always like to stress the statistic that three out of four people over the age of 65 do not fall. So we want to be those, one of those three rather than the one that does fall. And we also began to look at our own attitudes and beliefs about falls. And we practiced a exercise routine that is specifically designed to build the balance, the flexibility and strength to help you um, reduce your risk of falls. So just a heads up about that exercise program. We are not going to take the time during session two and three, today and next week, to actually do the exercises together. They are pre recorded, so I invite you to view them, to use them, to practice them at least a couple of times between sessions. Um, and that way, we'll have the time available to do new content. I know Linda has a lot to cover today when it comes to room to room safety. So what are we going to do this week in session two? First and foremost, we're gonna take a look at the take home activity that you had in your packet. We're not going to do practicing the fall prevention exercises, although I hope some of you will do that when the session is over. We're going to explore the benefits and barriers to activity and exercise in older adults and then identify specific risk factors, whether they're in the environment or in you personally, that would contribute to a risk of falling. Last but not least, we're going to work up, based on what we've talked about, a personal action plan for you, for, your, uh, for preventing falls. So just a little bit about Zoom etiquette. We are going to mute everybody during the presentation part. We will be opening periodically to comments from the audience 
First, we're gonna be reviewing the take home activity. So you'll have an opportunity to share. A few people will have an opportunity to share. Um, we'll also um, have a poll at the end of the session, which will only, is only three questions. So I would please encourage you to complete that before you leave the meeting. And if you have anything coming up that you'd like discussed or a question you'd like to ask and the microphones are not open, there should be the option of a chat window in your screen. So you can type in your question and we'll be happy to answer it. Okay. So let's look at the first item on the list, your take home activity, exploring your thoughts and concerns about falling. Now, if you remember from your handout or if you have your handout in front of you, that would be great. Um, we asked a couple of questions during that survey. You know, what was it you were concerned about doing? How realistic did you feel that fear was? And was there something you could do to reduce your fears and concerns so that you could, could participate in activity that was attractive to you? So I'd like to open the mics at this point. Uh, if somebody will indicate that they'd like to share their uh, take home activity, that would be great. We could take a couple of people on that. Raise your hand. Cheryl, we can unmute Cheryl. Hold on a second, Cheryl, you're still muted. You can unmute yourself. Go to your little microphone. There you go. Hi oh, there. How are you? I'm well. I've fallen several times in the past two years and all different types of falls. But my fear, uh, the most fear I have is falling down uh, a, a step or a curb in a <clears throat> in the shopping area because uh, I've already done that and uh, it wasn't fun and uh, I also got hurt so I wanted to know I think it's a reasonable fear and I find even and I do take a cane with me now but even having the cane I never know do I put the cane down first or my foot down first and sometimes I'm even afraid using the cane, like I start to shake a little, you know, just in fear. So you're, the, the activity is going shopping. That was the activity you yeah. want to feel yeah. more comfortable participating yeah. in. And according to your experience, having experienced a couple of falls, you would say that fear is pretty realistic. Yes. Okay, so are you looking at your sheet here? You, what did you rate that as um, very dangerous or somewhat dangerous? Uh, I rated it a 10, very dangerous, because um, it, it is, and especially when you fall and you can't get up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Okay, so you are taking some steps already to make that activity safer for yourself. Yes. You're taking those assistive devices, your cane, whatever, to help you get around. Now, the, the second to the last question, Cheryl, was what will happen if I give in to my fear about not participating in this activity? Well, it will curtail me from going shopping where there's a curb. And I find there aren't enough of the handy handicapped curves uh, like where uh, Target and uh, and Marshalls are. Mm -hmm. there, there's more sidewalks, but I find we need a couple of more lower curbs for, for uh, wheelchairs and people who have a problem walking up and, and down a step. So, um, you know, I could, I, you know, I could suggest to the city, but who knows what, what the city is doing now. We have too many other problems. But that, uh, that doesn't mean that your problem is not important. Right. So, right. you know, and I, I, 
I like your thinking that, okay, so this is the way it is. I'm doing this so far, but I need to extend my influence perhaps a little further by contacting yeah. the city officials. Um, that's a great idea. Why not write a letter? Um, is there any other way that you're thinking that you might make that activity a little bit safer for yourself going forward? Uh well, the other thing, of course, is using the cane. And um, I really can't think of any other way. You know, I, I don't think I can talk myself into it. I have, but when I've forgotten the cane, it's like, oh, how am I going to do this? And there's never a person around. Like, sometimes you'll see a person, and I'm not shy, and, uh, you know, I'll say, excuse me have a little problem going up and down this curb. Uh, can you help me? So that's yeah. another very assertive, very yeah. proactive response you can make to that situation. I see Scott has his hand up. So I think he wants to maybe weigh in on this. If you don't mind. Hi, I Cheryl. don't mind at all. Hi. We will, um, Hi. We'll talk specifically with demonstrations about cane use next week, but I, I'm a, a strong advocate of using a cane that has a solid base on it, not just a stick, because that doesn't offer s strong enough support. So we, I'll show you some examples and we could talk about how that makes a difference. Um, and I also remember you mentioning early on about not being sure what to move where and first. So we, we will review that. But if you need to go out in the meantime, um, if you have a leg stronger than another, we always recommend that you go up with your strong leg and when you're coming down, you lead with your weaker leg. Mm -hmm. right. And the cane will always be on the side of the uh, weaker leg to give you extra support. And that should always precede your movement. So cane and then strong leg, then weak leg as you're going up. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? And yes. mm -hmm. the, the idea of getting to a, a situation and realizing you've forgotten your cane, that's a matter of habit. So you're going to include that with all of your going out uh, in public or leave an extra one in the car so you always have it. Because that's the the risk of um, saying, well, maybe this time I can manage it is not worth it, right? Uh, yes, and I always do leave one in the car. Thank you, but sure, sometimes sure. I forget it in the car, but that's okay. And and I also thought I have not been uh, to a neurologist, and I'm I'm thinking of making an appointment Very to good. just make sure it's nothing physical. Very good. And that's great, Cheryl, because Linda's going to be speaking in a little bit about interior, meaning, you know, what's inside of us that might be um, limiting our activity and certainly our eye health, our foot health, our neurological health is very important to preventing falls. So good on you. It sounds like you're a very proactive person. If I could throw in one other suggestion, take a friend shopping with you. That way you get a little companionship as well as getting to enjoy an activity like shopping. Thanks okay. for sharing, Cheryl. I appreciate that. Do we have one other person who would like to talk about how they approach that activity, that take home activity? Can I jump in just with a thought? First of all, um, I was going to ask, I didn't get the packet of information. So if someone can just email it to me, that would be wonderful. Um, but you know what also, um, when I was having some problems, what, one thing that I tried to do is not necessarily park in the um, handicap area, but park where there might be a, a shopping cart and grabbing the shopping cart from there. For some reason that always used to give me a little bit more stabilization and a little, I felt comfortable with that. Just a thought. And this way you put your pocketbook and, and your cane in it. Right. So just a thought. Great suggestion, Mary Ellen. I really, I like that. So yeah, if it, you, one of those situations where all the handicap spots are not really accessible, that's a great alternative. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. And we'll make sure you get all the materials that you, you need Thank going you. forward. So does anyone else uh, who worked on the home, am home activity want to share their process? Go 
going once, going Jen, twice. Jen, Jen's raising her hand. All actually. right, Jen. Okay, this might sound strange, but um, cross country skiing. And I have um, a long history of cross country skiing, but I haven't done it lately because of fear of falling and hurting myself. So do you have the, uh, the way you work through that activity? So you're afraid of doing your cross country skiing. And yeah. the second question was based on your experience, how realistic are your fears about the, how dangerous that activity is? Well, I think it's between a five and a 10. Okay. And how could you approach that to make it more accessible for you? and safer for you. Yeah, I thought that maybe I should just stick to flat ground um, and um, practice first, you know, right around my house when there's someone around. <laughs> so, you know, practice getting up from the ground, um, you know, because when you cross country ski, you, you fall. I mean, even when I was young, I used to do that. But falling on snow is very different than falling on concrete. I know. I fell in a parking lot once when I was doing cross-country skiing. Not skiing. I fell in the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> and that wasn't any fun. It wasn't any fun, Jen. But yeah. I, I, also, I love the suggestions you're coming up with and the idea that you're going to go out, you're going to test yourself on some flat, familiar terrain, you're going to get a sense, and you're going to have somebody with you in the event that something does go amiss. Mm -hmm. I really like those, uh, those ideas. And we all know that winter is coming. Our activity <laughs> is going to be somewhat more limited than it has been. So anything we can do, and we're going to be talking about this next, to remain active is going to help with preventing falls. So we want to build up that the muscle strength and the stability to prevent falls. Thanks for sharing, Jen. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So let's talk a little bit about, oh, we're not going to do that. Remember, the exercises are recorded, and you will receive a link to that so you can practice at home. So what is the difference between physical activity and exercise? And I just want to throw in a little aside here. There's a wonderful book that I recommend to everybody, whether you're a senior or not, um, and it's called The Blue Zones. And it looked at many different cultures around the world that had a high percentage of people living to be over 100 years old, and not just living, but living well. And a commonality among these groups was that they were physically active. They didn't go to the gym. They didn't have a personal trainer. They didn't have a Nordic track down their basement. They were physically active. They walked. They took care of their homes. They tended their gardens. They moved all the time. So physical activity is actually any body movement requiring skeletal muscle and requiring energy. And exercise is just kind of a more formal cousin of activity. In other words, if you do get on a treadmill or you do decide to go for an organized walk or whatever, a, a mile walk where you're actually clocking the mileage rather than just going out for a stroll. But it's designed specifically to maintain fitness. You might be working with lightweight weights. I know in some of our... Um, discussion groups, Linda has guided people through how to use uh, objects you have around the house to build up muscle strength, including soup cans, bags of rice, that kinds of thing. So those are the differences. And I don't think I need to spend too much time on this when we think about all the ways that we can have barriers to activity. And we talked about those internal factors, how Cheryl was going to go see her neurologist to see if there was any contributing problem there. Your vision, your hearing, the medications you take, the physical condition overall that you're in affects that. And certainly the environment, the weather, 
the structure of the, the ground, whatever, can interfere with activity. Well, what about some of the benefits? Again, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on this. All you have to do is go out and breathe some fresh air and get a little movement and you know how much better you feel. But the things that you can't see is that your circulation improves, your appetite improves, maybe you sleep a little better that night. And when you have arthritis, probably the worst thing you can do is immobilize your joints. I had an orthopedist friend that used to say, life is movement and movement is life. And we all know that once you stop moving, it's very easy to lose that muscle strength and conditioning. I was reading somewhere that one week of bed rest is the equivalent to aging two years. Now that's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. So mentally, certainly, I don't know about you, but if I'm not moving around a lot, I don't feel as well. I don't feel as positive about my my life certainly it improves there's lots of research to show that physical activity benefits not only the body but the mind it increases our our brain's ability to function well and during these times of uh, covid there's the opportunity to have decreased feelings of isolation in my neighborhood it's really interesting to see how many people are just stopping to chat with one another even if you don't know each other very well, you're chatting from a social distance through a mask, but you're still connecting with other people, and that's really important. So I'm gonna stop talking now and turn the floor over to Linda Schrager, who is going to uh, take us through safe at home, room by room. Okay, can I share my, do you have to unshare first? I do. I'm gonna do that right this very minute. Uh-oh, what just happened? Let's see. Okay. All righty, let's just see. Let's see. I always want to sing the Jeopardy song when we're doing this. You I know. know. Oh, poor Alice, <laughs> by the way. I know. A word, a word of silence for, for everybody. Rest in peace for Alice Trebet. <laughs> exactly. Alice. Yeah. Okay. So in um, just sort of going on with what Judy was just saying, some of the losses that impact our ability to live safely in our homes. And as I said to you last week, that's my area of interest. Um, I am an occupational therapist and I do home care. So I'm in people's homes uh, every day. And vision loss is something that we all go through. Changes accelerate after age 50, they get more severe um, as we continue to age. And discerning closely related colors, especially in the blue-green spectrum may be difficult. So think about, look around your house and see what color your paint is and what color your furniture is, um, your walls especially. It takes longer to focus when moving from dark to light and vice versa. So we want to clearly mark hazardous changes in floor levels. Um, we will look at some pictures of this in a moment. And position the furniture away from the areas where you walk. So I've been into someone's home. They have, let's say, the living room. There's a big piano right by the doorway going out. So every time they get up from the couch, they have to walk around the piano to get out the door. And you could just slide the piano down a few um, feet and move it out of the way. Up sliding a piano is not always easy, but you would need help with that. But that's the kind of thing that we look at. Um, adjusting illumination throughout your home. So, oops, sorry, excuse me. So that you don't want, you want good wattage, the highest wattage as possible, um, but you want to eliminate glare. And sometimes additional lighting will be helpful um, to have the, uh, Target sells, they call it a torchier lamp. Um, it's like 12 bucks and it has a swan neck with one of the bulbs and you can just put it right behind you if you're working on a project. 
ask for an annual eye exam um, after the age of 50. That's kind of a normal thing that we do um, if we haven't had them going along. And multifocal lenses uh, may blur or distort your vision looking down. So if you do wear that kind of a bifocal type of a thing, you want to be um, careful of that because it could um, be a problem, especially going down the stairs. And looking at cataracts and, and of course, you know, keeping an eye on that. And I noticed the other day, this is a new thing, but masks. So I was, I went to actually get my flu shot the other day. I was in line at CVS and I came out and I was looking, I had my mask on for my scarf and I thought I lost it. And I said to the people behind me, did you see a scarf laying on the floor? And the woman says, it's around your neck. I swear to you, I could not see. The mask comes out a little bit and blocks you looking down. So that's, you know, keep an eye on that. Um, okay, so here's an example. And this happens to be a house in the Nork. Um, and for some reason, a lot of the homes are built this way. This is an odd thing. This is the door leading out to the uh, driveway. So already that's a problem coming in halfway um, on the steps. But the reason why I like this picture is as you can see, they took little treads and these yellow um, strips and they marked the walls. And it makes it easy for you to see where the steps um, begin and end. So that's a great little thing that you can do. The other good thing about this picture is they have a nice banister going down. You know, we're all gonna have, many of us are going to have a basement. So, you know, if you wanna try to make that stairway down to the basement, as safe as you can. Hearing loss, um, you know, we um, want to go to an audiologist for a baseline exam, check to see if your hearing is okay. Something like Clear Captions is a company where they set up your phone and it will display the text of a phone call right on a screen. And it's great. Um, it happens to be free and um, they will come in and set it up for you. You just need to have internet and you need to have um, a, a prescription from your doctor, not that says you're deaf, but just that you have any kind of a hearing loss. So that's a great thing to look into. And it amplifies the handset so you can hear. Another thing use lined insulated drapes, carpet, um, absorbs extra sound. Um, audible warnings um, can have, if, if you can hear, if the um, doorbell rings, perhaps lights can flash on and off, letting you know that that has happened. A vibrating alarm clock, you could place it under your pillow if need be. Uh, so that type of thing. Most of us have closed captioning on our TV. Um, excuse me, and you can text, which is, you know, something now that we have, so you can read the message on the phone and uh, not have to hear it. So another um, fall factor, something that has been identified um, by the Na National Council on Aging is, of course, looking into your medications. There are some prescriptions and over-the-counter meds that can cause you to be dizzy, that can cause you to be dehydrated, that can interact with other meds that you're on. So certainly you should review your prescriptions and you might have heard of brown bag events where people literally take all their meds, put them in a bag, go into the pharmacist and have the pharmacist look through them. Um, now, of course, if the important thing is that you wanna to go to the same pharmacy so that you don't wanna be getting stuff from CVS on that block and something else from Rite Aid on that block because then they won't know what you're taking. If as long as you go to the same pharmacist and they have it all in their computer, you don't really have to bring in, in the brown bag anymore because they can just look it up. But a pharmacist is a very important member of your team and they can help you and look through and see. And you'd be surprised. There's some things that could be causing you to feel a little dizzy or lightheaded that you wouldn't be aware of. Okay, so let's start by going through the house here. And let me just see if I can move that out of the way a little bit. Um, okay, so 
this is an entryway and I show this, um, it, it's, it's the, the ideal entryway because there's no threshold here. And obviously you can't go out and change the front of your house right now, but it is important to think about how is it entering your home? Um, because sometimes people have trouble just getting in and out in the first place. So this is great, there's no threshold. I show this picture also because um, it has this little peephole for safety. Uh, this window that you can look out when people ring your doorbell and, and see who that might be. And a little chair sitting next to the doorway is great to sit, um, to put your packages on while you're fumbling for your keys so that you're not holding too many things at once. So that's just a nice picture. And and while I'm, I'm on the front door, um, this is not have to do with falls, but it's something to keep in mind. Make sure that your house has good well-lit large house numbers so that should anyone be trying to find you, um, they can find the house easily. Over time, the number falls off, it flips over, it fades with color, and it's sometimes hard to find the number. As I said, I do home care, so I'm driving up and down the streets half the time looking for people's houses. So this is a walkthrough, um, and I like this because it just shows a few things in the living room. So many times, this is the setup. You have the couch here, the chairs across, the coffee table right here, and the person will come in, and if they have an assisted device, like a walker or a cane, they walk in through here, and they tend to, quote, park the walker or put the cane down, and then sort of fight a little bit to fumble to get in through to sit in front of the couch. And simply, I just say, look at the room and maybe change it. Take this coffee table and push it out about two feet away from the couch. That way you can walk in with your walker or cane, turn and sit right down on the couch. And you're not sort of trying to shimmer through in between this furniture. So make sure you have uncluttered pathways. That's the point here. And um, that will be very helpful. Linda, I had a question from, uh, from Judy Moore. Um, does New York law allow zero clearance for doorways? Well, I have had several people who have had zero clearance. Um, that's a very good question. New York law, um, I don't know. I'm not sure. If anyone else has the answer to that, they can share. I, I, I've never heard that being a problem. I wasn't sure either, but it might be, I know that with new construction uh, and people downsizing because of um, getting older and wanting smaller living quarters, that there's more focus on design that is um, age friendly. So exactly. I can, <laughs> um, Judy, I will look into that for you and see if there's any rules and regulations that would be a barrier to that and I'll get back many, to you. Many on of that. the 55 and over communities do have their front doors that are zero threshold. Many. So I'm not sure, you know, I'm sure that they would be aware of that and it doesn't seem to be a problem. But thank you for bringing that up. It's, it's certainly an interesting question. So I often have people who have trouble with um, just getting on and off of their furniture. The concept is the higher the better because it's easier to get off of. So, and also pushing up, having arms. So this is, I call this a captain's chair. It's the old fashioned type of chair, but it has arms, a firm seat, and the beauty of it is you can press up from these arms and stand. These are furniture risers. You can get them at Bed Bath & Beyond, Amazon. Um, and as long as your furniture has a foot, a leg like this, that can go into this little divot, you can raise your chair three or four inches. And I will tell you, it makes a huge difference for people. So just think about how hard it is for you to get off your couch, off your chair, and that might be an option just to raise it. Because when you go to try to get off, if you're struggling, that's where you could have a fall. Loss of dexterity is another problem that many of us have. Um, it's, it's not really fall related, but I just wanted to throw it in there. Think about if you do have arthritis, weakness in your hands, um, any kind of Parkinson's or tremor. This is a lever door and it is the easiest, a lever door knob, the easiest knob to work. So you can easily change your doors. Um, this is a little lever light. You can just press it with your elbow, with your finger and boom, you can um, turn on the light. 
So the kitchen, so you want to have everything accessible. Um, the beauty of the double stove, many of you um, who live in the Newark, the, the older homes, uh, the stove is low and you go to take out that big turkey in a couple of weeks um, and it's hard to bend over to lift it up. Um, the beauty of this is it's waist height and it's easier to take that turkey out and place it right on the counter. So think about, you know, if you're bending low to get things out of your um, oven. The other thing is here, it's, this is a French door type of refrigerator. Uh, the reason for this is the reason why they're popular is because we feel that most things we do, we take out of the refrigerator versus the freezer. And so this way um, you have better access to the things that you need the most because they're at waist height. Um, using cabinets, um, I'll have people who, they have their favorite pot or pan and it's way in the back of the cabinet. Um, and they're bending over and they have a fall just reaching for it. So this way, um, this was a good, nice use of a little tiny area, um, but you can pull it out and easily access cans because sometimes also the cabinets over the counter are so high that you're reaching up. Um, I did have a woman, her fall was in the kitchen on the um, stool reaching up to get cat food. So, um, you know, tr please don't climb on stools unless they're really safe and there are safe ones. A one step up wide base rubber bottom stool with a handle, uh, that will be okay. But other than that, you don't wanna be climbing up. And this is another example of using the space and bringing pull out, making pull out shelves where then you can, they come to you, you are not reaching in to grab that pot. The bedroom, so again, you know, my concern with falling in the bedroom is a couple. You want the height of the bed to be okay. Um, sometimes it's, it, as I said, the higher it is, the easier to get out of, but often if it's too high, you can't lift your legs up on the bed. So a rule of thumb is 90, 90, 90. You wanna have, you wanna sit on the edge of the bed and you wanna have your hips be at 90 degrees, your ankles at 90 degrees, and um, your knees at 90 degrees. So your feet are flat on the floor. If you sit on the edge of the bed and you're dangling in the breeze, the bed is a little high for you. Um, the other thing is be careful of your bed spread. So what happens is you see this little corner here and after when you're in the bed and you know you throw the, the bedspread off, it can gather right in here and then you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and you trip on your bedspread. So be very wary of your bedspread of where it is uh, in the room. This bed rail is a great, um, it's, it, you can order it again on Amazon or at a durable medical supply store locally. And it has a piece of wood here that fits between the box spring and the mattress, but it just gives you a little something to help to grab onto to get on and off of the bed. So they're great. This is a modification I did for someone. The husband, this was his side of the bed. He could get up, but he had trouble then rising from the bed. Um, he, he was very unsteady. So we just put a rail right here along the wall and they loved it. He could, he could sit up, reach for that rail, grab it and pull up and be safe. And he could walk his way all the way to the end and then go um, get to the bathroom. So the bathroom, where I spend most of my time doing most of my modifications and OT's life, I always say, is in the bathroom. This is a great thing, it's a safety tub rail. Um, it comes, again, my favorite words, no installation necessary. It squeezes onto the wall of the tub, right there you can see that, and um, that's a, a great modification. Gives you two heights of handles to step in and out. And the handheld shower head is just um, again, something that if you're sitting and you can take this off, it comes off of the little knob here and you can hold it and you can wash yourself. <coughs> Excuse me. Linda, this if is I a could, shower. Just, could I just interject here? Sure. Um, we're seeing a lot of great products and I'm, I'm thinking as people are, are looking at these slides, they're thinking, gee, that would be helpful for me or uh, a relative or a friend or a neighbor. Um, can people reach out to you via phone or email to get a list of distributors for these different um, That's a great idea. Assistance. We can do that after. They can always call me or I can make a list. Um, we can type it up and 
send it to people. So, you know, a lot of locally there's, there's durable medical equipment stores um, that they, they sell all of this equipment. And, and I love them. They're good to work with because, you know, they are local. Uh, one of them in particular delivers for free. But I, I will be honest with you all to say that nowadays, Amazon, if you do have um, the ability, especially Amazon Prime, the things are definitely a lot cheaper. So um, I, I say to my clients, do you have a, 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 you know, a son or a grandson who's on Amazon Prime? Because they might not be online and they might not be buying online, but the, the kids always are. So, but I will definitely write a list of this stuff and where to get it. And we sure. can send it out in the follow-up email to people who have participated in the, in the session. Great idea. That, that would be so great. This is, but can I just say one more thing about the equipment? Sure. I think it's really important that before you choose equipment, that you have a consultation with an OT or a PT to make sure you're getting the correct equipment for your problem. Because I don't think, um, in terms of risk of fall, I think the misuse or inappropriate use of adaptive equipment can be equally dangerous. Would you agree? That definitely. So that is what I do for a living is that I go into people's homes and assess them and then make recommendations such as this. So yes, um, the point of this is to show you all what's out there and what's available to get you thinking so that if you're having some trouble getting in and out of the tub, for example, you might say, I would be a candidate for this. But then yes, if you can have someone come in um, to assess you, to tell you the right kind and how to use it. I joke that I, many of my clients, they have a walker or a, or a cane, especially a walker. Oh, where'd you get the walker? Well, my uncle um, Alan died and this was in their attic and my you know, cousin gave it to me. So many people walk around with this, just assisted devices to walk with and they were never assessed by anybody. Is it the right size? Is it the right height for you? So yes, um, you'll be meeting some OTs, more of them next week. And um, there is no question that getting an OT or a PT assessment is the way to go before choosing any of these things. So this is a tub bench, and the difference between these two chairs is you can see this has two um, legs outside the tub, and all four are inside the tub. And the difference is if you can step over the side of the tub, then you don't need this one. You could just get this one. But if you have trouble and you're worried about stepping over the side of the tub, then this one is a transfer bench, so you sit out here and you slide your way in. So that's the beauty of that. And, and many falls happen with people trying to get inside into their tub. Falls happen getting on and off of the toilet. And so this is a raised toilet seat. Again, the problem is often, and especially in many of your old homes, the toilets are maybe even 15 inches high. Standard comfort height is 17 to 19. Look at your toilet and see what you think. It's a long journey down. And if you're having trouble, especially even getting on it, sitting yourself down on it, but getting back up, there are many different products um, out there that you could consider. I like it, of course, better with arms because it's easier to get up and down, but sometimes you might not have the room for that. This is a toilet frame. You might not need the height. Maybe you do have a good height toilet, but you find you're having trouble pushing up. So this is called a versa frame, a toilet rail. And as you see, there's no height there, but it gives you the rails. Grab bars, grab bars, grab bars. So if I say nothing else, if nothing else sinks in, this is very important. Everyone, everyone should have grab bars in their shower, no matter what the situation. Um, but what you would benefit from is someone to come in to show you exactly where they should go. So in the um, interest of time, which we're kind of running out of, I won't go through all the different ones, but please know that if you do not have a grab bar in your tub or shower, please, please consider that. Um, here's another quick accessible um, uh, bathroom. And why I show this is because this used to be a glass door, which is very hard to maneuver getting in and out of. So they took off the door and put up a curtain. And um, that was great. And then they have a, a grab bar here to reach to get in and out of. Combination grab bars, some people don't like the look of grab bars. They feel it's too institutional. This is a toilet paper holder that doubles as a grab bar, holds 500 pounds of weight. And this is a, to uh, a towel rack 
that is also an official grab bar. Don't use your towel rack to hold on to in the bathroom. It can pull out of the wall. Remember that, you need a real grab bar. And this was just a bar we put up opposite the toilet for leverage. So that's another example of needing a therapist to come in, look at your situation and help you to see what your leverage and your strength is and then show you where to place things in the, uh, the proper place. The stairs, um, stairs can be a necessary evil, but we, we do need them. Um, and you wanna make sure the rise isn't too high. It should be between six and seven inches in your house. And, and um, they, should be, they should be even. I, I was in a house the other day and weirdly the stairs were uneven and that will set your gate off and could definitely cause a fall. Handrails, if they can be on both sides of your staircase, that's great. You want a light at the top, a light at the bottom, um, if possible. You, um, you know, if you want to be able to reach, hold on to your banister good and make sure it's in there stable. Give a grab and make sure it hasn't started to come loose a little bit. Extending the banister beyond the staircase is important. So what happens is you've got this banister and it ends at the top, before the top step or before the bottom step, and I find that often. So we'll go and we'll just extend it past the staircase because that way you have something to hold on to when you get to the landing and you take that last step. So that's an important thing. And you know, people, they, stair lifts really can make a huge difference. If you're living in a two-story home, you wanna stay in your home, um, you can consider something like this. It's, it really can make the difference between people staying home and needing to go to a different um, home. So these are great. They, they uh, do their job. They're very easy to maneuver um, and they can be expensive. So it's not a light modification. There's no question about that. But if you love your house and you just feel that you're at the point where you can't do the stairs anymore, this can be great. The doorways, um, sometimes people have trouble getting in and out of their doorway. I'll go to someone's home and show them how to do what I call a side step in with their walker because some of the old homes, they're so, the doorways are so thin that you can't even get your walker through. So um, there's a technique for that. If you can't get into the door and, and it's, it's becoming difficult, this house, we took off the door. We put up a curtain. Um, a curtain rod and a curtain, the, they have their privacy, they can shut the curtain um, and they can get into their bathroom. This is called an offset hinge and it buys you a couple of inches. So you switch your hinge to this and it makes the door open wider into the room. The garage, again, putting up grab bars when you get out of the car. Um, they have a great steps here. They have or grab rails here to help the person to get into the kitchen. So preventing falls, the major causes, as we've talked about over the past couple sessions, environmental hazards, which we just went over, weak muscles, poor balance, dizziness, side effects from your meds. And these are some predictors. So how hard is it for you to rise from a chair? That will show you um, that you might maybe benefit from a strengthening exercise program. How is your balance? Have you fallen in the past year? A fall is an indicator that another one might happen. So you're all doing the right thing by coming here and, and learning about um, how to prevent that fall. And of course, medications. So what we can do, talk to your doctor to evaluate your meds. Tai Chi is a greatest um, class you can take for improving your balance. Uh, consider therapy to improve balance, get moving. As we said, and Judy pointed out, assess your need for a walking aid and assess your need for any of the equipment that we just talked about and adapt your environment as needed. So, okay, I spoke very quickly and now I'm going to turn it back over to Judy. Oh, thank you so much, Linda. That was just it's amazing what's available to people if they just take the time to look. And I hope that based on what Linda showed us and what she talked about, that it's kind of a natural lead in to this next step, which is creating a personal action plan for fall prevention. As I've heard it said, if you, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. So based on what you've seen today, 
based on what we've talked about, begin to think about something that you would like to do within your home or within your personal internal environment that might help you decrease your risk of falls. And you have this on your handout. This is take home activity number two. So the first thing is to choose something that you want to do, not something that your neighbor is saying you should do or your grandchildren are saying you should do, but something that you choose to do to create this positive change. Make sure it's action specific. So in other words, if I say to you, I need to organize my living room so I can get moving around more freely, that's not really specific enough. What I'm thinking of in terms of specificity is I need to remove the throw rugs or I need to move this piece of furniture. Very, very specific. So you can measure it. And then you're going to ask, it's going to answer the questions. What are you going to do? When are you going to do it? Not someday I'm going to call so and so to help me move this piece of furniture next Wednesday or whatever day you choose. <laughs> and then last but not least, you're gonna ask yourself, how confident are you that you'll be successful in following through on your action plan? Now, obviously you wanna hit for somewhere above seven because if you have zero confidence, you're probably not gonna do it. And if you have a level 10 confidence, chances are good that you've already done it in your home. So you wanna look for that you know, that sweet spot, which is maybe seven to nine, that you're confident that'll be achievable. So that's your homework for today. I see there's something in the chat box. I just want to see if there's a question. There, Judy, the question is, what suggestions do you have for getting out of a car? Okay. Um, can I answer that? Absolutely, there, Linda. There are, well, first of all, again, that's, um, something there's there's a technique to it that would be great to be able to show you i i did a video i did a tv um quick spot for spectrum tv i wonder if they still have that on tape i would love to try to find that but there are also some gadgets um that you can get one is called the handy bar um H-A-N-D-Y-B-A-R, handy bar and what that is is it's a little gadget when you open your door in the either the passenger or the driver's side, there's like a, there's a, a word for it, which of course I don't know, but it's a metal ring that's in the door and it's in everybody's um, door. When you, and you attach this handy bar to it and it actually makes a, like a little grab bar in the car. And um, it's great for pushing up from the seat and from letting yourself down. There's also um, an item that goes over the window. You, you kind of, pop it over the window and close the window all the way to hold it on. And it makes like a little, um, sort of a, a little rope to hold on to, to help pull yourself in and out. So there are some gadgets for the car. And depending on what your problem is, there's also, it's like a lazy Susan. It sits on the seat of the car and you back up to the car. Let's say um, this is the passenger. You back up and you sit down. So your feet are on the driveway and your tush is on this lazy Susan and then it helps to spin you in if you have trouble lifting your legs into the car. So there are a lot of things that you can do and again it would be great to have someone work with you. It would take one session to show you how to use those. May I jump in Linda and Judy? Absolutely. I'm gonna stop um, sharing. First of all I always feel I always feel for Susan. I don't think she intends to be lazy. It's just that she's uh, efficient. <laughs> But I have that device and I have the um, the handy bar um, at college and I'll add that to our uh, presentation for next week. It's just That'd a, be great. Perfect. Um, and I also, I think the group has maybe discussed CarFit before, but that is a, a group I'm involved with that um, helps with that. And that's one of the things that we show, but definitely um, rising from the seat once you're in there is challenging. So we'll add that to our presentation for next week. 
Great. That's why I'm glad you're here, Scott. You get to hear the chatter and what people are interested in hearing. And also, I, I noted uh, when I saw the whole group, two of my colleagues are also here being very quiet, but uh, Megan Donito is uh, one of our occupational therapy assistant um, professors, and she's helped with the low vision. And David Pallister is a new uh, member of our faculty. He is with um, the Occupational Therapy Master's Program, and they are both um, looking forward to working with NORC in the future. So I uh, just wanted to acknowledge my other colleagues. Thank you, thank you. And CarFit is a program we've done every fall, Scott, through the NORC. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't do it this fall, but no. we've done it in conjunction with um, Colony Senior Services Driving Center. So Good. hopefully next spring or fall, if things are back to normal, we can get back and up and running for that. Absolutely, maybe I'll see you there. I, I, I do a few local ones. Yep. So I think that it, I'm looking at the clock, it's, 10:59. Can you believe how timely we are? That is just I'm a, amazing. I'm on a tight ship, Judy. I know. Um, so I'd like to um, invite all of you to uh, complete the poll at the bottom. I'm going to launch it now. Um, you should all be able to see this. There are three questions. So you'll have to scroll down. So very simple, very quick. And we'd like to hear from all of you. So I hope you can all see the poll. What are the questions, Judy? Okay, so the first question is, prior to beginning this session, how would you rate your concern about experiencing a fall, not concerned at all? somewhat concerned, concerned or very concerned. The second question is, the information presented in this session was very helpful or useful, somewhat helpful, useful, not helpful, useful. And the third question is, how likely are you to practice the fall yeah. prevention exercises no, 